Barbara, can you see my slides? Yes, very well. Shall we start? I think so. Okay. So can I just go? Yeah. Yes, and introduce yourself and uh, and uh, and just go. <laughs> okay. So I'm Caio Coelho here from the Brazilian Center for Weather Forecast and Climate Studies co-chair of the Working Group on Forecast Verification Research with Barbara Cassati. And uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, verification on subseasonal to seasonal time scales. And uh, the idea is to start with a very brief review of some of the uh, contents that we heard already about forecast goodness that was introduced by Barbara Brown, just very briefly. Then, I will go through the motivation for um, why we want to use the attribute based forecast quality assessment, as we already heard about the importance of that, but I'll just reinforce some of the key ideas and uh, show some examples for that on a few uh, time scales from some seasonal to seasonal and some uh, exercises where we will see how we compute some of the measures to assess some of the attributes. And then finally, I'll make some uh, general remarks. So as you heard from the talk from Barbara Brown and on Monday, I think, um, the key person who introduced many of the oh, about modern forecast verification is Alan Murphy who wrote this paper in 1993, where he defines uh, what are, as you remember, a measure of the correspondence between the forecast and the observations using some mathematical relationship. And this can be done for deterministic forecasts and also for probabilistic forecasts. And for that, we need to have some measures. And another key important aspect of forecast goodness is value or utility, which is a measure of the benefit that we achieve or the loss that is incurred to the use of the forecasts. And then the finally, the third um, goodness aspect is consistency, which is the correspondence between the forecasts and the forecaster's belief with the appropriate representation of forecast uncertainty. So in this lecture, we will focus, as in the whole uh, summer school, on quality. And particularly, we will be looking at some of the attributes that are related to forecast quality, which are listed here on the right. And uh, we will uh, reinforce the idea that has already been uh, said for many lectures that we need to use not only a single measure or a single score, to have a full assessment of the quality of forecasts, because different measures, different graphics, will assess a different particular aspect of quality, and it will be looked at in terms of these attributes that you see on the list on the right. So to give you a brief uh, picture of what I'll be talking about, this is a figure that I borrowed from the people from IRI, which was facilitated by Nachikita. Um, as you can see, the quality of uh, forecast in different time scales vary from weather to subseasonal to seasonal predictions. There are different levels of quality that we know the current knowledge of our capability of producing forecasts is summarizing this figure. And I will be showing you some applications and some interpretation on how to compute some of those scores on two time scales, the subseasonal time scale, which is here in the middle, where we'll be looking at uh, forecasts of weekly averages, and also we'll be looking at forecasts on the seasonal time scale that we will taking we'll be taking uh, examples from monthly forecasts up to seasonal forecasts at average of order of three months. So starting off with the attributes for uh, deterministic forecasts, we will be looking at the ensemble mean predictions, and then we will see how close these are to the observations using the 
attributes that are associated with deterministic forecasts. So the first attribute that we usually look at is association, which is a measure of the strength of the relationship between the forecast and the observations. And the very simple and most used uh, measure for that is the product moment correlation coefficient, which is also known as the Pearson correlation coefficient, as you can see here on this slide. So you have a, a number of pairs of forecasts X and observations Y, and you just compute the correlation between these two uh, sets of uh, data. Here is an illustration. So what we are looking at here is the scatter plots of the forecasts ensemble means on the x-axis against the observed anomalies on the y-axis. And if you compute the correlation between these two uh, data sets, you can see that the correlation is 0.54. So we have a very good positive association between these two data sets, just telling us that the forecast and the observations go more or less in the right direction when you go for high anomalies, positive anomalies, the forecast go in the direction, and then you go for negative anomalies, the forecast go in the right direction of the observations. But this is just a, a single number and don't tell us the full story behind those forecasts. For example, if we plot now the regression line between the forecast and the observations, which is given by this red line, you start to see that there is some biases there are some biases in the forecasts. The blue line would be the perfect association between the forecast and the observations, the perfect match. And you see that in that case, the red line provides us an indication that this slope of this regression is not as steep as the perfect line in blue. So you can see that the slope incorporates this correlation in the formula that you see in this slide but it also includes uh, information about the variability of the forecasts and the observations, the standard deviation of the observations y divided by the standard deviation of the forecasts x. And when you look at the data, you clearly see that the slope is not as perfect as one, is less than one. That's because the variability of the observations in this example is less than the variability of the forecasts. So by looking at an additional information ratio of the standard deviations, we'll tell you a bit more about the quality of the forecast rather than looking at just a single number of for the correlation between these two data sets. Another aspect that we generally look at in this time scale is uh, accuracy in terms of the attribute of accuracy. In that case, we are trying to see how close the forecasts are to the observations. And one of the simplest measures that we can use is the mean error that you have here, the formula. You just compute the difference between the forecast and the observations and do the average. And you can have an idea about how close the forecasts are from the observations. There are other measures, as you saw from the other lectures, like the squared errors that are measures of accuracy as well. But here is just providing a very simple example as a bias, as an accuracy measure. An example here for seasonal forecasts, a Japanese model, a seasonal forecast for December, January, February over a 30 year period. So you can look at the correlation between the anomalies that were forecast and observed at each grid point. That's the first map that gives us an idea about the strength of the linear association between the forecast and the observations. But as we said, the correlation is just one single number that don't tell you the full story. In the bottom, you have now the ratio between the standard deviation of the forecast and the observations. And then you can see that is mostly blue, indicating that the variability of the forecast is generally less than the variability of the observations. So it's an additional information that the correlation don't provide to you. And on the right, you have a third information that is the bias of this forecast. And then you complement with a new additional information about where the model overestimates or underestimates the mean seasonal precipitation of various parts of the world. So three complementary measures. Another example here for us, uh, in that case, looking at the monthly time scale, 
at five, a few different lead times, zero, five, 10, or 15 day lead times going from top to bottom, on the left for precipitation and on the right for two meter temperature of the NSAP NOAA model. As you can see, you can start to have an idea about how the quality of the forecast in terms of association degrades as we go far in terms of lead time from uh, the forecast starting time to the forecast target period. As you go for longer lead time, the quality of associate, association measure goes down for both, both variables. Um, another final example here for the sub-seasonal time scale. Here we are aggregating forecasts that were started in September, October, and November for the second uh, fourth night. So it's a two-week lead time forecast for the second fourth night for the Australian Bureau of Meteorology model. And you can see the regions where the strongest associations are located in Australia by aggregating all the scores, all the uh, uh, anomalies that were forecast over the period of years from 1980 to 2006. So these are just illustrations of how people use the association correlation or bias or ratio of standard deviation for looking at quality of uh, ensemble mean predictions. So now looking at the second um, part of the attributes that are more relevant for probabilistic forecasts. In that case, we are deriving probabilities from the ensemble members. And Nachikita yesterday already provided some of the idea about how you use these probabilities by computing the, the ratio of fraction of members uh, between falling in a particular category divided members or by fitting a distribution, theoretical distribution to the ensemble and estimating probabilities. Once you have those probabilities, then you start to look at the quality of those using some attributes. And the first attributes that we will be looking at is discrimination, uh, which is the conditioning of the forecast on the observed outcomes. And these attributes address the question of, does the forecast differ given different observed outcomes? Or can the forecast distinguish events from non-events? And you usually say that if the forecast is the same, regardless of what's the outcome, the forecast cannot make any discrimination between an event and a non-event. And forecasts with no discrimination ability is generally said to be useless because the forecasts are the same regardless of what happens. So to illustrate what that all means, we look at this example of a Pacific, uh, equatorial Pacific sea surface temperature anomaly predictions for this line here from the Indian Ocean for the maritime continent here in the Indonesia up to this point here in the coast of um, Peru in the South America. And we will be providing forecasts of uh, sea surface temperature anomalies along this uh, uh, parallel of, along the equator. So on the left here is the observed um, temperature anomalies from 1980 up to 2000, more or less. So you have this positive anomalies when you have El Niños and negative anomalies when you have La Niñas. And in the middle here, we have the observed anomalies, the same as the first plot, but now they were divided in beans of when a positive anomaly was observed, it's painted here in red, and when a negative anomaly was observed, it's painted here in blue. Just binary information, the binary image of the first um, plot on the left. And in the middle here, we have the forecast probabilities that were derived from an ensemble of models indicating what's the probability of observed, observing a positive precipitation, positive sea surface temperature anomaly. So what you see is that the high probabilities are again painted in uh, colors of darker colors in reds and lower probabilities in blues, indicating that when you have high probability of a positive anomaly, it's in these colors, and uh, when you have a low probability of observing a positive SST anomalies, you have the blue colors. When you start to compare these two 
panels here, you already see that there is some good match between high probabilities being forecast when a positive anomaly was observed and low probabilities being forecast when a, a negative anomaly was observed. So you can already have an idea about some sort of discrimination here. But how can you do that more formally? Uh, one way of doing that is just splitting your sample in two halves. So you look at the probabilities that were issued for the event when the observed uh, temperature were above normal, and then you get those numbers. So you basically use this binary image here to extract only the probabilities here for the red points on the central image here. And then this is what you see here in this box plot. When you extract that sample of forecast probabilities and plot that box plot, you see that when you observe the positive SST anomaly, you have issued a large number of high forecast probabilities. And you do the same for the other parts. You extract only the forecast probabilities when they were issued a probability of a low probability for, uh, sorry, uh, forecast probability for the non-observed events, which are the, the blue uh, image, the blue dots on the image before, and then you have the second sample for those cases. And in that case, you also can see that the forecast probabilities were low for most of the cases when the event was not observed. So you already see here that by looking at these two box plots, the distributions of forecasts are very clearly distinguishing the occurrence of the event when you issue a high probability for the event occurring and the event occurs in most of the cases and a low probability for the event occurring. In other words, the event of Cisapertina not occurring and the event really doesn't occur. So you clearly are able to distinguish here events from non-events. So this is a way of looking at the discrimination. We can go a step further and uh, make a calculation to quantify how, how much discrimination you have in your data. And for that, as you remember, you can look at the ROC and curve. And for that, you need to look at the construction of frequency uh, tables. And for that, you have to compute the heat rate and the false alarm rate. It's basically the heat divided by the total number of observed events and the false alarms divided by the total number of non-observed events. And you repeat this process for different threshold of forecast probabilities. And then if you do that, you get a curve like that for that uh, example that we saw on the previous slide. So this is the ROC curve for that sample. And what you see is that uh, for each threshold probability that is uh, shown here from in this example from 10%, 20%, and go down to 90%, you have a dot, but you can do that for all possible issued forecast probabilities, and you have this curve that's called the empirical ROC curve. And what this curve is telling us is that if you compute the area below this curve, you find that you have an area of 0.79. That means that you have as 79% uh, of the probability of uh, successfully discriminating a warm event, a positive SST anomaly, from a cold event, a negative SST anomaly is 79. So this is a very high and much larger than the 50% probability of distinguishing occurrence of no occurrence of the event, which is given by this diagonal line, which has an area of 50% of uh, distinguishing occurrence from no occurrence of the event. So this is a, a way of assessing discrimination, quantifying this uh, from that sample of data or forecast that we looked at. And uh, an interesting aspect of this kind of curves is that when you look at this um, uh, steepness of the curve on the top or on the bottom left of the curve, you can have an idea about which forecast probabilities have some good quality. So the points that are here on the ellipse on the left, indicating that you have good ability for the high probabilities to indicate that the warm event will occur, and the tops that fall on the top 
on the right indicates that you have good ability of indicating that the warm events will not occur. So um, I will briefly now illustrate um, how you can compute in practice this curve with this example of um, sea surface temperature forecast for the Nino 3 region in the equatorial Pacific. And here you have 20 years of observations and 20 years of forecast probabilities for the occurrence of uh, El Nino's neutral or La Nina conditions. And we will assess in particular the quality of the El Nino predictions. So for computing your ROC prediction, uh, the first thing you have to do is to define what are the events and the known events. So you go into your observations and then you look at how many cases an El Nino occurred and you should count that they are observed El Ninos here, you find that there are five. And if you want also to compute the known events, you go again in this column and count how many uh, non El Nino events occurred, the La Ninas or neutral conditions, and you have 15 uh, cases. So out of 20, you have five El Ninos and 15 non El Ninos. So events are five and non events are 15. Next, you have to start thresholding your uh, uh, forecast probabilities to compute the heat rates and the false alarm rates for each different threshold probability. If we start from the 0%, and you look at all the cases when you issue the forecast probability of 0% or larger, that case is all the forecast probabilities are equals to or larger than zero. And then you count the hits first, the cases when you issue the forecast probability that is larger or equal to zero and the event was observed. In that case, you have five hits divided by the total number of observed events. That's your uh, hit rate. And then you do the same for the false alarms. In that case, you have 15 false alarms that you issue the forecast probability, but the event did not occur. And then you have, again, the total of 15 non-observed events. That's your false alarm rate. And do again for the next threshold probability, 20%. So now you look at only the yellow uh, numbers here that are larger or equal to 20%, and you do it again, you find how many hits you have, in that case, were four, and divided by the total number of observants, and then the false alarms in yellow, uh, not bolded rectangles, that are five divided by the 15 no observed events. So that's your false alarm rate. And you do it again for 40% and find the hits, in that case, you have four hits and divided by five, and then the false alarms, in that case, you have three divided by 15. You keep doing that for all threshold probabilities. For 60%, you have three uh, hits divided by five, and then no false alarms divided by 15. 80% probability, again, you have three hits, and then no false alarms. And then finally, for your 100% um, probabilities, you have two hits and no false alarms, and then you have your hit rates and false alarm rates. Once you have all those numbers of hit rates and false alarm rates, uh, you can now plot these numbers in your diagrams like that. And then you need to compute the area below those, uh, that, that curve to find your uh, This you can do by using the trapezium rule and divide your your area in a few trapezius, and you can have also a rectangle, rectangle in the middle, and then you add up all these um, areas, and then you find, in that case, you have 85% probability of successfully discriminating occurrence of El Nino from non-occurrence of El Nino's. Um, important points to remember then about this ROC. The ROC, the area the ROC curve, you tell us the, about the probability of successively discrimination events from non events. That means that, in other words, it tells us how different the forecast probabilities are for events and non events. Remember those box plots. You want to know how different you can make the forecast probabilities when the event occurs compared to the, when the event doesn't occur. 
And as uh, we remember the events that we are looking at are binary, they have only two possible outcomes. The probability of correctly discriminating or distinguishing the events from the non-events by chance or by just guessing is 50%. And this is represented by the area below the diagonal 45 degree line in the ROC plot. And another important point is that the ROC is not sensitive to biases in the forecasts. And for that, we need to use another diagnostics that for assessing bias, that is the reliability diagram, which we'll be looking at next. Um, before looking at that, we have here just a few examples of um, practice on how you look at those results. Uh, for example, in seasonal predictions, this is a seasonal prediction hind gas assessment of our model here in Brazil. And here, what we are looking at, at each grid point, you compute the ROC area for that grid point. And then you do a transformation. You just do twice the area under the ROC minus one, in, in the sense that everything that is above 50% becomes positive, and everything that's below 50% becomes negative. So you can have a skew score in that case to see how well you are, how much better you are compared to the reference guessing, uh, random guessing uh, forecast for that event. In that case, you're looking at positive SST, uh, precipitation anomalies. Another example here for the Japanese model. In that case, we are looking at um, uh, temperature forecast for monthly forecast uh, issued in a particular day for the next 29 days. And you can do that for different regions around the world. This is Northern Hemisphere, uh, tropics, or Southern Hemisphere. And you have here the values of the area under the ROC curve, telling you how much you can distinguish, in that case, temperature in the upper tercile for temperature not in the upper tercile. A third example here for the subseasonal time scale from the European Center, you can look at how uh, through the year, uh, your, as you are producing your subseasonal forecast, aggregating through the season, you can compute that, for example, for the four season of the year, what is the average uh, ROC that you get from the monthly forecast system in that case? for the temperatures in the upper tercile, and you can compare that with a forecast of uh, persistence of the conditions from the previous week. And this you can see here on the graphic, and you can see how the, the quality in terms of discrimination vary throughout the years, and also compared to another forecast strategy. And a final example here, again, for the Australian model, uh, in terms of mapping the area under the ROC curve or this forecast produced during this period for September, October, November for the second week. So a half month lead prediction for the second, uh, second fourth night. So it's a 15 day lead forecast for 15 days in the future. So you have an idea about where the areas are above. For example, these oranges are 55% where discrimination much better then the random guessing is in large parts of the country. So uh, I have a thing here on the top of my screen that I want to get rid of before I continue. Let's see if I can. Um, so uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is um, the other two attributes, reliability and resolution. Uh, which are also important for probabilistic predictions. So if you remember, we talked about that already in the lecture from Nachi Kita, and I think Laurie also already introduced that in his lecture in the beginning of the summer school. Reliability is actually the correspondence between the forecast probabilities and the observed relative frequencies. An example is if we must, uh, the events that we are forecasting must occur in 30% of the occasions that we issue a 30% probability of the events to occur. So if you issue a forecast probability, you have to be consistent in terms of the frequency of uh, occurrence for that probability that you issue. That is reliability. 
Resolution is the condition of the observed outcome on the forecasts. If you remember discrimination, resolution is exactly the opposite uh, conditioning. Discrimination is the conditioning of the forecast on the observations. Uh, resolution is the condition of the observations on the forecast. It's the other way around of looking at the, the relationship between forecast and observations. And resolution addresses the question of does the frequency of occurrence of an event differs as the forecast probability change. And if the events occur with the same relative frequency, regardless of the forecast, the forecasts are said to have no resolution. And forecasts with no resolution are useless because the outcomes are the same regardless of what is forecast. So a nice way, as I think uh, Machikita introduced yesterday, to look at this attribute is by looking at the decomposition of the Braille score, as you can see here in this slide. And this was first proposed in this paper by Murphy in 73. So you have a number of forecast probabilities, PK, and a number of observations, binary observations, OK, for the event occurring or not occurring, as we are talking about binary uh, conditions here. And you have a total number of N pairs of forecast probabilities and observations. And this equation on the top, which is the squared error from the probability space, which is the Bryce score, can be decomposed in these three components, the reliability component, the resolution component, the uncertainty component. Um, let's start with the uncertainty component, which is a component that doesn't depend on the forecast. It's just a function of the observations. So basically, when you look at your climatological data sets, your vector of binary observations, and you make an average of those observations for the event you are forecasting, and then you find the observed frequency, observed climatological frequency of that event, that is this O bar here, and the uncertainty is this O bar times one minus this O bar. So this only depends on the observations. And for example, if you have uh, an event that always occur, that means that your vector of binary observation is always once, and then the average of that will be always one. So there is no uncertainty on the event. We will know exactly what's going to happen. The event always happen. That means that this term goes to zero. There is no uncertainty on the forecast uh, uh, event that you are forecasting because you know that it always happens. And the, and the opposite case and the other side is the when the event never occurs. So your binary vector is all full of zeros, always. So the event never occurs. Again, your O bar will be all full of zeros and the average of those will be zero. And then in that case, um, the, your uncertainty term will be zero. So you know exactly what's going to happen. The event never occurs. There is no uh, uncertainty on the event you are predicting because you know that it's never occurring. So uncertainty appears in the events that have values of a uh, climatological uh, observed frequency different from zeros and ones. And the maximum value of this uncertainty term, if you look at this is a quadratic equation, then you find that the maximum value will be at the event that has a 50% probability of occurrence that you end up with an uncertainty term of a quarter. That's the maximum uncertainty that you can have on this equation for this kind of event. And then the, the, the other terms are uh, related to the comparison of these two quantities here. The first is the forecast probabilities, and the second one is the observed frequency of the, uh, the, of the observed frequency given that you issued a particular forecast probability. So you first have to look at uh, beaming your data into a number of beams. In this example here, I'm uh, providing you 11 beams. So I'm going to be looking at forecast probabilities for a beam of 0, 10%, uh, 20%, up to 10%, 100%. For each of those beams, you count how many uh, forecast probabilities you issued for that uh, beam. This will be your large NIs here. 
And then you, when you sum over all these n i n large n i's here, you end up with the total number of your sample. And then you look at for those occasions when you issue that forecast probabilities, in how many occasions you did observe the event. So, and this is your observed frequency for that particular forecast probability. And then you have to compare these two numbers. And if you have a really good and reliable prediction system, your forecast probability will have to match your observed frequencies. So these terms will be tending towards zero. And then you don't, have, you don't add anything to the bias score. So you want to minimize this distance between P and OI. And here you have the, the resolution component where you are looking at now the difference between these two numbers. You have again here your observed climatological frequency of the event you are predicting, and here the observed frequency for a particular forecast probability that you issued. And then in that case, as you have a negative uh, term here, you want to maximize this distance here to be able to issue forecast probabilities that are able to make observed frequencies that are far enough on the climatological frequency to have a good uh, resolution, good ability to issue forecast probabilities that are different from the climatological frequency O bar here. So how you look at that in terms of uh, interpretation? A nice way of doing that is by interpreting this equation with the use of the reliability diagram. So here you have the reliability diagram. And uh, what you see here is a plot of this n i's um, this, uh, this um, uh, bar plot here at the bottom. So for each forecast probability from p equals to zero up to p equals to 100%, you count how many forecast probabilities were in your sample. Is your, is your, are your n i's here? And this is the known the sharpness diagram that uh, we heard already about in the previous lecture as well of yesterday. Um, and then uh, the reliability diagram will be the plot of your forecast probabilities against your observed frequencies, O bar i's. So it's basically a plot of those two numbers here. So the forecast probabilities on the x-axis and the observed frequencies given you forecast a particular forecast probability in the y. This is your reliability plot. Um, the horizontal line here is O bar i is the uh, observed frequency, the climatological observed frequency of the event you are forecasting. In that case, is for exactly that example that we saw uh, earlier of sea surface temperature across the equatorial Pacific. And as we are looking at positive or negative SST anomalies there, uh, in that case, we have probability for forecast positive SST anomalies, the, this climatological frequency is exactly at. So uh, the interpretation of the reliability uh, components is basically uh, when you look at this diagram, uh, the, dotted, the dashed line here is the reliability curve we get from that exactly the same example we looked at earlier from the sea surface temperature in the equatorial Pacific. And what you are seeing is that uh, if you had a perfect reliability, you, you would want your forecast probabilities to match exactly your observed frequency. You wanted to have a line going along this diagonal line here. But as you can see that the forecasts that you have are not as uh, well reliable as you'd like. So this uh, feature of overconfidence that um, Achikita mentioned to you yesterday, high probabilities are issued more frequently than observed, and low probabilities are issued less frequently than observed. So when you are trying to assess reliability, you are trying to minimize this distance between this, for, this, line, this dashed line and this uh, horizontal, this uh, solid diagonal line here to minimize this distance between these two lines, which is the minimization of this term here for improving or reducing the, uh, the contribution for the Bryce score for improving your reliability. So what you'd like to have is a 
dashed line that goes as close as possible to the diagonal, diagonal line to make sure we have a good reliability on your forecast. And the interpretation of this term here comes from the comparison of these two uh, numbers in the diagram, which is the observed frequencies for each issued forecast probabilities and the climatological um, uh, frequency of the event you are looking at. So if that is the horizontal line and the distance between the horizontal line and this uh, dashed line that you have in here. So what you want to have is to maximize this distance between this horizontal line, which, which is known as the known resolution line. That means that for any forecast probability or observed frequency doesn't change. What you want to have is to have a good variability of the observed frequencies as you change the forecast probability. So you want this horizontal lines to be tilting towards as much as possible towards the diagonal line to maximize this area between the dashed line and the horizontal line to have uh, improved resolution, improved ability of issuing, uh, of having observed frequency that vary as much as possible along the issued forecast probabilities. So this is how you look at the relationship between these two terms, the Bryce score and the reliability diagram. Um, an interesting aspect that is also important to mention is that when you are talking about, for example, climatological forecasts, in that case, you have a climatological forecast that they have 50% of chance of occurrence of the event that is represented by this dot line here. As you can see, this dot, this dot blue here in the middle, you can see that it's perfectly reliable. You are exactly along the diagonal line when you issued a forecast probability of 50%, you observed the event in 50% of the cases, but it also has no resolution because it's always a fixed value for any forecast probabilities. You are never going to have any variability on the observed frequencies. So that means that the climatological forecast, you never have any resolution. So if you have here uh, this equation, if these two terms are zero, that means that your Bryce score for your climatological forecast is given by only the uncertainty term, which is the variability of the observations. And how you compute this uh, graphic, uh, just a very brief explanation and uh, simplification. So as you remember, you, we talked about yesterday, Nachi mentioned that we need large samples to be able to construct this kind of diagrams because you have to have enough data in each of those beams to have a sort of a smooth curve to be able to have reliability curve. In that example, we have a large number of uh, forecasts. We have 22 years of forecasts and 3,000 grid points gives us 66,000 forecasts. And then you first thing you have to do is to ask yourself a question. You define the event you want to forecast, for example, temperatures above zero, positive anomalies. And then you look at your sample of forecast probabilities for temperatures above zero, positive anomalies. And then you count how many uh, occasions you issue the 100% probabilities. That gives you 8,000. And if you have a perfect uh, uh, forecast system, you would want to have a frequency of observed in occasions that the event occurs as 100%. You would want in all the 8,000 cases, you want to observe the event that you issue the forecast probability. But in practice, you find that you only uh, observe the event in 7,200 occasions. So that means that only 90% out of your 8,000, you really uh, observe the event when you issue the 100%. And then you do again, you go for the 90% and then you find how many cases you issued a forecast a probability of 90%, in that case is 5,000. If you have a perfect system, you would want in 90% of those 5,000, in that case 5,500, to observe the event. But in practice, you find that in only 4,000 cases out of this 5,000, you really observe the event. So your observed frequency is only 8%. And you repeat that for all forecast probabilities. 
And once you've done that, you have these two columns here, the column for your forecast probabilities, and on the right, the last column of the observed frequencies for the real forecast you are looking at. Once you have those two numbers, you just plot one against the other, and then you construct your relationship. And just to find, finish off, just a few illustrations about how people use those uh, kind of uh, assessments in publications in the area of subseason and season predictions. Here is an example for the UK Met Office model assessing the quality of uh, NICSI level pressure, uh, NICSI level pressure forecast for December, January, February, for an area in the Northern Atlantic or uh, sea level pressure in the upper and the lower tercile, which are in blue and uh, red here. As you can see, the predictions are quite uh, well aligned over here, the diagonal line, much better for the lower tercile predictions than for the upper that has some issues here for the higher probabilities. But in general, there is quite a good quality in terms of both reliability, which is well aligned here, and resolution also because we are very far away from the horizontal frequency of occurrence of the climatological frequency of occurrence of one third of the event here. Um, another example uh, here for the Japanese model in terms of monthly forecasts, again for two meter temperature in the upper tercile for the days two to 29. And uh, you have a similar sort of assessments in terms of uh, quality for northern hemisphere, tropics, and southern hemisphere. And you know, ones are better. In that case, it looks like the northern hemisphere temperatures have better quality than the other two regions. And um, a final example here for the um, Bureau of Meteorology comparing different versions of their model for sub-seasonal predictions. Again, 15-day lead prediction for the second, fourth night. As you can see, um, the previous two versions of the model, the blue and the gray, green ones, are much worse than the most recent one in that, indicating that the changes that they've done in the model for producing the ensembles and then generating the probabilities helps to improve the quality of these probabilistic predictions. And in that case, uh, here we also have these uh, gray um, uh, areas, which are indicating the points within that areas are the ones that contribute positively for the BRIASQ score for the quality of these predictions, as Nachikita mentioned to you yesterday. And uh, a few comments to finish off in terms of um, uh, verification uh, in across time scales. And this is something that we have been uh, discussing within our working group for a long time. And uh, in terms of uh, verification in different time scales, we are particularly looking at the consistency of the use of verification across different time and space scales. And in this paper, there is some discussion about that from a previous workshop we had. And to finalize, um, I, I'd like to just mention that uh, there is clearly the need for an attribute-based verification so that we can have a complete forecast quality view of this uh, sub-season and seasonal predictions and need to use more than a single score to have a more detailed forecast quality assessment to look at the different aspects as we saw in these uh, examples that I've shown you. And sub-seasonal to seasonal verification is kind of naturally leaning towards what we call seamless consistency concepts that addresses questions of which scales and phenomena are predictable. And as these time scales go various ranges from days, weeks, and months, is naturally leaning towards a seamless verification development. And uh, just to our, as additional reference to the others that have been included in the presentation, I leave here also two other uh, documents that are I think could be useful. Uh, the one is that uh, a guidance document for verification of seasonal forecasts that were produced by Simon Mason, and a book chapter that we wrote as a work from this working group 
uh, on the verification on sub-seasonal to seasonal time scale that was published uh, two years ago in a book of the S2S prediction project. So with that, I stop here and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Th thanks, Caio, uh, for the talk. I think we have a few questions in the chat. Um, do you want me to read them for you? Yeah. Please. So, so I have a question for myself that I'll leave for last. I think you answered that in the final slide, actually. So starting from Elena's question, she's asking about the area under the rock curve. Uh, if we want to compare the prediction with a climatological reference that is not the random 50-50% split for the event and non-event, can we still use or meaningfully interpret the area under the rock curve value? So can, can we compare that the area under the rock curve with something that is not a 50-50% random split, like the climatology? I don't think it's possible. I think this is uh, tailored for doing that. I don't think there is a way of looking at the comparison of the ROC with something that is different from this 50%. I don't think there is a way, or I, maybe I can, other people, they have. I can a, comment. I can comment. Yeah, yeah, sure. If I may. Yeah, the, um, the, the, ROC, the area under the ROC curve is cooked up to be insensitive to the a priori probability of, of the two classes because um, the AUC, the area under the curve, the probabilistic interpretation is the following. It involves two cases. So if you take one day from the non-event class and another day from the event class. So two things, one event from a non-event, one day from a non-event class, one day from another day from the event class. Given these two, what's the probability that the first one will be forecast uh, correctly as a non-event and the second one will correctly be classified as an event? So it, it's a conditional probability on the two things belonging to their own classes. As a result, it, the, the, the relative size of the two classes doesn't matter. A, a random um, forecast, no discrimination will always correspond to 50%. Okay, thanks, Karen. Um, so maybe uh, we should move on to Stephen's question. So he, he asked two questions. The first one is, um, most of the S2S models have different start dates, at least from the S2S project models. How do we compare their performance? Also, so some are produced on the fly and others are frozen. So that's the yeah. first question. Yeah, this is a problem in terms of um, sampling that maybe uh, there are some cases like in the S2S prediction that we cannot be as clean as in other cases where you have the design of the experiments being set up that all models have exactly the same initialization, go for the same Heine-Cast production. And uh, there is a, a technical problem because there are some models that are, most of the models are not using exactly the same initial conditions for doing that. And uh, even though there is not completely comparable, the way that I've been dealing with that is at least trying to find um, uh, for the same Heinecast period, uh, at, at finding initial conditions for the same weeks, even though this is not exactly the same date. But if I have a, like 10 years and I have 120 forecasts, one for each uh, week, I get that for all the models to have exactly the same amount of information and do a comparison even if I know that the initial conditions are not exactly the same for all the models and the initial dates are not the same for all the models. So that's a technical problem that we have in subseasonal predictions, but there is a one way that you could look at knowing that there is this deficiency in the comparison that you're not comp comparing exactly things that are completely comparable. And the real time and the hind cars frozen and the on the fly is another problem as well, because some data will become available, be updated very frequently, others not. And then you have to deal with these practical problems by doing some sort of things like, similar to what I mentioned from the first question. Okay, so uh, thanks. And there, there is a second question from Stephen. 
So fr from the WMO point of view, the ROC and reliability diagram are the standard verification metrics for seasonal forecasting. Are there standardized verification metrics for S2S predictions? Yeah, that's uh, things that is coming. We are now in the process of uh, defining the global centers for subseasonal predictions under the WMO infrastructure. And uh, together with that, there will be the standards for subseasonal predictions that will be basically the same as we, what we have for subseasonal predictions. So the ROC and the reliability will be there as well. Okay, thanks. So if if there are no other questions from the students, I just would like to maybe go to, to my own question. I, I think it was uh, more or less answered by your last slide, the one that showed the scales um, that related the, the the time scales and the spatial scales of, for, for for comparing things, for comparing forecasts. So my question was originally about the the, the sampling rate when you calculate correlations. So for example, if you have uh, an S2S model or a seasonal a long a long scale model and you want to calculate the precipitation uh, performance, what sampling rate should you use? So should you use daily? Uh, precipitation or accumulated in weekly windows, for example, because if, if you do an accumulation that will kind of smooth the data, you you will, in a sense, improve the performance, right? Have higher a higher correlation. But is is this fair, or is the, yeah. is there some, some some methodology to find the ideal way to compare your like to to determine the sampling rate? Yeah, the the way people usually do is to look at. Uh, uh, aggregating, as I mentioned, in weeks, 15 days, months, and seasons, because we know that as for longer time scales, when you aggregate averaging over a longer period of times, you increase your chance of really finding something that is predictable in that time scales. So the averaging is one of the strategies for uh, being able to predict some phenomena because the underlying assumption is that things will persist for a long enough period of time and then you have to take into account when you define your predictions and then when you do the computation of your scores you have to go in that direction and you have to assess the information in terms of those time scales and okay. for each time scale you repeat the same in the way that i've shown here here people are looking at the same sort of measures, but aggregating the data on these different time scales. Okay, so, so it's kind of subjective to what you're trying to, to capture. You can, you can. Yeah, it's subjective, but you have an idea that by looking at, you, you will not be able to look at daily information on very longer time scales. So you know that if you do averages on seasons and months, you'll be better predictable than looking at daily information mm -hmm. at longer yeah. time scale. On the weeks as well, if you go to day 16 on, if you try to look at daily information, you know that you'll be much harder to get. So you try to aggregate a bit the data after 15 days into a few weeks. And that's because you know that the signal will be better indicated in the prediction. And then you have to apply a verification on those time scales that you aggregate. Okay, thanks. I, I believe we have another lecture in one minute or so. Uh, given given that uh, I'm, I'm the next lecturer, given that I am the last lecturer, I think today, right? I'm willing to um, postpone the start time, give give people a chance to take a five minute break and start five minutes late, as long as everybody's willing to promise to stay with me five minutes late. Uh, 